All right, is it recording? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, well. um, okay. So the form of practical knowledge provides a deep, original, and compelling account of Kant's practical philosophy. It illuminates those parts of Kant's corpus, in particular the groundwork in which he articulates his practical philosophy, both through attention to the subtleties of those texts and through a clear understanding of the place of the practical philosophy within the broader critical project. And it does so while avoiding the specialist vices common to much secondary literature. Kant is rather presented as a sophisticated modern part of a practical cognitive tradition with ancient origins, a tradition from which contemporary ethicists and philosophers of all stripes stand to learn. And we really appreciate that. Uh, so the first section uh, deals with some sort of general questions uh, about the place of the work broadly and uh, in different respects. So we'll get to those. Uh, so in the preface to the form of practical knowledge, uh, you know that some developments in modern culture and modern life, so for example, scientific advances and increased global interconnection have made it difficult in philosophy to bring the concepts of practical reason and practical knowledge into focus. Um, so we're kind of wondering how those developments create our position as inheritors of this grand tradition of practical reason view. Uh, and then second, there's a kind of part two, and uh, you can divide this up, of course, however you'd like. Um, there's an apparent resemblance between this claim uh, about the developments in modern culture and modern life and themes explored elsewhere in this practical cognitive tradition by some neo-Aristotelians. So for example, McIntyre. And we're interested if you could compare or to see if you could compare your diagnosis of the ethical problems uh, of modernity with those kind of from these familiar neo Aristotelian uh, diagnoses. Sorry, that was a lot. Uh, once there okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I took all of that in, but I think I've got the um, the overall shape of the the question, so I can give it a uh, I'll give it a shot, and you can. Um, Tell me how how well I've done. I'm sorry to thank. Um, <laughs> um, right, I I do um, highlight in the uh, in the preface the uh, the 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 pressures you might say that that modern culture in various different connections have has um, placed upon um, philosophy. Uh, and it's a relationship to what I think of as our ordinary um, moral understanding. Uh, and these um, these forces are manifold and hard to uh, describe or identify with any precision. But um, it has seemed to me that um, just to keep things kind of simple for the for the uh, for the moment, uh, the, the 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 most striking um, um, development, at least as far as philosophy is concerned, is the development of the the natural sciences in the in the seventeenth and eighteenth century, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth centuries. Um, of course, it's a there's a long movement in the in the late Renaissance, early modern period of of developments um, in in the natural sciences, but they really um, began to register in the minds of philosophers in the um, in in the 17th century. Um, um, we know of Hobbes, Descartes, and others who who um, inspired by the developments in the new sciences tried to reconceive philosophy in a way that would be more congenial and uh, enable it to comprehend and accommodate the the striking kinds of knowledge that seem to be now um, um, becoming um, becoming available through the through the um, the development of of this, of this new science and I think that um, from that point on um, modern philosophy um, has been enthralled by these new scientific developments. Um, it just continued, you know, generation after generation. And that that development has 
I think led philosophers to to emulate the wow. um, the methods of the new science um, or just science, um, um, natural sciences especially, um, and the role that mathematics plays within those um, within the, the modern sciences, and as a result, much of the um, philosophy that's emerged since the time of Descartes and Hobbes has had this um, um, tendency to um, look at its subject matter, whatever it might be, um, in a fashion that that in some way models itself on the the methods of the the sciences, especially the sciences that involve uh, mathematics. And that has um, bled over into practical philosophy as well. So we find in starting in in really with with Hobbes and Hume and continuing all up to the present day, we if we find a tendency to about ethical phenomena from a kind of natural scientific point of view so far as we can manage it. Obviously, no one thinks that, you know, interacting um, moral subjects are atoms bouncing around in the void, but but there's a tendency to adopt that um, detached scientific um, attitude towards human interactions, which um, has a kind of effect or sh shapes the way of thinking about about human practical interaction and life, so um, that what that what that um, has done, I think, is um, or the effect of that is, has been to separate practical philosophy to some extent from the kind of understanding of human practical life that was taken for granted through you know. Um, many, many centuries of study of practical topics, um, starting with, from antiquity and continuing up into the modern period where it began to come under this pressure I've been describing. And um, I think that as a result of these pressures, um, modern practical philosophy has become somewhat alienated from actual ethical life. And uh, this has not been, um, noticed by um, me myself alone, it's it's something that's been widely noted. Um, and there have been attempts to recover some better understanding of human ethical um, human ethical life um, as a kind of reaction against the, this press of the modern um, modern science informed point of view. Um, now, in the in the book, I'm trying to um, recover that understanding that or that older philosophical understanding that um, I find still alive in the works of Kant. But I'm um, I, I I want to also credit the. Um, the development in the over the last few few decades of the neo Aristotelians you mentioned, um, McIntyre is certainly one of them. I've um, been impressed by some of his work. I am a little more familiar with the the work of um, 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 Elizabeth Anscombe and Philippa Foot, um, but there are uh, quite a few who are turning to ancient sources, um, Aristotle maybe above all, in search of a kind of um, understanding of practical life that's more in line with the way we, al we, we, we all already understand it before we're philosophers. So um, I've <clears throat> um, not so much in this in this book, but in other writings of mine, I have noted this um, kind of multi-pronged um, development of attention to historical sources that you know go back before the beginning of analytic philosophy um, as a as a way of helping ourselves to get back down to the ground of ordinary life 
Uh, and <clears throat> so I've been one of one of my interests in pursuing my um, investigation of Kant is to think about his philosophy and his practical philosophy in particular in relation to that um, that older tradition and in relation to Aristotle in particular. And so I've been, um, along with others, um, trying to encourage a kind of, um, shall we say, a rapprochement between uh, these two trends that have emerged um, since around the time of the 60s or 70s uh, uh, in the 20th century, um, trends that initially were viewed as or viewed themselves as hostile to one another. The the um, the students of John Rawls were um, excited by the way in which Rawls was opening up um, um, a kind of a Kantian approach to topics in ethics, and um, they viewed Kant's approach as quite different from the traditional eudaimonist um, thinking or teleological thinking of of um, a virtue ethics, whereas the virtue ethicists thought of Kant as a modern day ontologist and not in touch with the proper understanding of the virtues that we find in, in ancients like Aristotle and, and, and Plato. Um, but I think that closer investigation of the, um, of the views of say Aristotle and Kant um, begins to put pressure on that, on that notion that these are two opposing approaches. And I've been trying in my work on Kant to expose the, um, the tradition in which his thinking belongs. And as the preface sort of um, indicates, that tradition as I think of it goes back through Aquinas to Aristotle and Plato. Um, and Socrates should be maybe added as well. So I, so I, um, I think of I th I think so far as I can of these others like McIntyre and and Foote and and Anscom as as in a very wide sense fellow travelers. Um, we're all I think working on a common problem to the extent that we want to recover a better um, ethics and practical philosophy than was handed over to to um, to us by the. Um, the two two plus centuries of anglophone ethics which has been gripped by this um this um um maybe this is too strong a word but sort of infatuation with with scientific and objective um thinking in in philosophy not that we should go over to something subjective but it's um a kind of objectivity that's not suited to the the practical um, use of the intellect. So, um, so although you know, McIntyre was one of those philosophers who really thought of Kant as not the way to go, um, and although Anscom and Foote similarly distanced themselves from Kantian approaches, I think that um, when one looks more closely, one can see broad, deep affinities notwithstanding some striking differences. Um, but the different differences as I see them are largely um, differences in emphasis maybe and 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 complementary um, to to um, the other approach as opposed to um, points of conflict. So that's um, a first response. Uh, you can tell me where I've fallen short. I think that answers what it. What gaps I might need to fill? Yeah, I thought that kind of losing our concepts or like making it harder to have them in view theme was an interesting one. So I appreciate your uh, answer there. Yeah, one, I mean, I'll just mention one of the reasons why Kant is of interest is that he places so much emphasis on this in the opening page, in the opening stretch of the groundwork. You may you may remember um, he starts with ordinary moral um, um, moral knowledge. Um, uh, it's not easy to see because Kant thinks so abstractly and and, and writes so abstractly. But but um, if you can see through that, you can you can find him really starting with concrete ethical understanding. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I suppose the second question sort of continues this theme of recovering an understanding of practical reason um, and also developing an appreciation for Kant's practical philosophy, but with a more specific focus on our philosophico historical place, um, I suppose. Um, so um, that so this the second question uh, is um, so besides those developments in modern culture and modern life, another important barrier, which I suppose we were in a sense just discussing um, in response to the previous question uh, to adopting a practical reason view in ethics today arises out of the history ethics and specifically anglophone and, and, and analytic philosophy. So um, what are, in your view, the principal challenges that we in the anglophone philosophical world face in, appro in first appropriately appreciating Kant's moral philosophy? And second, how, in your view, have those challenges affected the reception of Kant's moral philosophy within the anglophone philosophical world? Right. Um, well, this, yeah, this question beautifully um, um, just opens up um, the next phase of reflection um, on the heels of the first. Uh, so what is it you're asking, in effect, um, that uh, about the modern Anglophone um, way of doing ethics that blocks us from recovering our pre-philosophical uh, relationship to one another and to topics of ethical concern. Um, it seems to me, and I don't think that this is much of what I'm about to say is not particularly, um, I think, well, it's it's something that many others would, would say as well. Um, and that is the, the um, there's a, a tendency uh, to think of knowledge um, as exclusively theoretical. This is a point that Anscombe is quite explicit about, and it seems to be closely connected to the emulation I was speaking of earlier that, that philosophers have developed for, um, or, or of the, um, the, the theoretical natural sciences. So, um, um, the, the paradigm seems to be um, physics, physical understanding of the natural world, mathematically informed. And this is the paradigm um, and has long been through the whole tradition of what it is to know um, in the primary sense. Um, there's some object or some realm of objects, reality, um, what is that's um, there somehow um, outside us existing independently of our knowledge of it. And we come to know it through the exercise of our senses um, and then the use of our intellect in, um, in uh, developing what, um, what impressions and um, states, mental states our, our senses um, deliver to us. We work up um, an understanding of, of the world somehow in using these two powers, senses and intellect. Um, but the thought is that this is what knowledge, um, um, this is what it really is. This is, this is the, the real thing. And um, um, I think that although it's not easy to, again to say with precision, I think that um, the success and the progress that has come with this way of, uh, with, with the, the, the new scientific um, investigation of nature, um, developing this kind of knowledge, the success that it's, it's enjoyed, um, when we contrast it with the seemingly um, endless controversies that we find um, in, say, in practical life, in political uh, discussion. Uh, and this was something that was very much on the minds of the early modern philosophers who were living through these civil wars in, in England, um, the difficulty of reaching agreement. Um, this, this contrast between the agreement, the collaboration, the development, the progress in the natural sciences, 
and the endless disputing and, and it comes to blows blood is shed uh and 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 lots of blood uh it makes it seem as though in the matters matters practical there's nothing but strife you know Hob hobbes image of a, a war of all against all kind of captures this picture of um the way human intelligence um the predicament it finds itself in when it attempts to direct um the will and and um and and, and action so there's um that 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 stark contrast um whether it's really as stark as people philosophers often imagine is a question that you know could perhaps merit some discussion but but there is this sense that there's a kind of failure of the intellect to achieve consensus and progress in the in the practical side of life um that 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 um feeds a kind of skepticism about our ability to gain anything like knowledge of how we should live and how we should live together uh and so there's been a kind of i think a kind of despair on the part of philosophers um anglophone philosophers maybe especially uh in the possibility of ever getting anything like knowledge um, or finding anything like knowledge in this use of the use of our intelligence certainly we do show um ingenuity and and um some kind of intelligence in practical matters we build bridges um, and we have to you know get together to to do that cooperate so there's some there's some kind of um um way in which the in, the the human intelligence can can um be constructively deployed in practical matters but it seems as though this success always has to do with um constructing means um to serve ends that a certain group of people happen to share but when it comes to agreeing about what the ultimate ends are uh it was you know widely thought by the modern moral philosophers hume is a preps and hobbes are the um good examples um th there was uh, a kind of skepticism that we could ever find a rational basis for adjudicating disputes about 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 what where our ends should lie what direction we should be pointed in so um the um the skepticism that i was speaking of didn't necessarily um land on technical um technical practical knowledge but it did um focus zero zeroed right in on the, whether we could ever um um use um our intelligence to to arrive at agreement about how we should order our lives together in the large what 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 the overall framework for living should be um and uh that's that's um i think been the um the principal um that that skepticism has been the principal reason why um modern moral philosophers have tended to look for other ways of arriving at some kind of a um an account of human of human um conduct a way of a way of um addressing questions of how we should live together if we can't do it by um calling on the intelligence that we have in our practical judgments about how to live maybe there's some other way we can we can um find um and so there'll be um um attempts to find objects that um or approaches that approaches that um view again human human um interaction from a kind of naturalistic point of view uh and um these will be pursued and, um people can agree that something like flourishing or um um success um will be a a sort of a a benchmark on which everyone can agree um as a basis for then framing a, a 
uh, a kind of a, an account of human social life. Um, and these these approaches, again, all all sort of take a kind of an outside point of view, for example, the point of view of a biologist or a sociobiologist looking at human interactions or an anthropologist. Um, but they never they never really um, want to think about the problems from the inside the way we confront them in in human life. Uh, and the 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 general um, implication or upshot of these um, attempts on the part of philosophers to step outside of human practical life and view it as in a kind of more clinical or scientific manner is that the uh, the accounts end up giving giving up on the objectivity that we think our practical thinking has in the first instance in ordinary thought. Uh, we when we when we think that we ought to do something, we'll we'll take ourselves to know it. Not in every case. There are obviously many difficult decisions in life where we're not sure what to say, what to do. But there are a wide range of normal cases, ordinary cases where it's perfectly clear what we ought to do. And in those cases, we're not hesitant to say that we know we ought to do it, that we know we should do this. We may say it's not, not going to be easy to do it, might not be pleasant, but we know this is what we should do. So um, those kinds of uh, convictions we have, that we have knowledge of how we should act, how we should live, are lost if we um, give up on the thought on the thought that there's some internal intelligibility to our thinking um, that can be can be articulated in philosophical terms. Um, so that's um, that's how I th that's I think the pressure comes from from that direction within Anglophone philosophy. Um, it's an attempt the attempt to because of the skepticism to step outside the actual practice on account of a loss of faith that there is anything like practical knowledge. Um, the intellect is used in practical matters, but there's a, a sense that um, in the end of the, at the end of the day, uh, it isn't knowledge we're, we're dealing with here. It's something, something different. And so the, um, the principle, I think the principal stumbling block or obstacle that blocks contemporary Anglophone ethics from, from recovering its relation to ordinary thought is this thought that the only genuine knowledge to us is um, either natural scientific knowledge or something that's bound up with that mathematical knowledge, for example. Um, that's always a kind of a difficult case for these philosophers, but but um, its role in the natural sciences um, always um, counts in their in their thinking. So we we have a kind of um, skepticism about the possibility of a kind of knowledge that the practical use of the intellect could could deliver. That's beyond merely technical know how. That's the main obstacle. Um, um, now you had a second question, I believe. Um, I'm not sure. I remember. I've been speaking, I think, to the first. Well, the oh, second. Oh yes, I can. I can repeat it. Um, so the second question was more um, specifically about appreciating uh, Kant's moral philosophy from with from this Anglophone philosophical perspective. Um, oh right. <laughs> right. So um, <clears throat> this this skepticism, as I've called it, um, about practical not only practical reason but about whether practical reason um, can yield up something like knowledge has has shaped the uh, interpretation of Kant's practical philosophy pretty much all along. Um, I um, I remember when I started out um, thinking and working on pra Kant's practical philosophy, um, it hadn't yet occurred to me that um, he is thinking of the that the that of reason's practical use as a cognitive use. I had um, taken it that his breakthrough, so to speak, was that um, um, the insight that that reason can be used in a practical way. Um, it can be used not only to know, <laughs> but also to determine the will to act. 
Uh, and that's that's already an important step. Um, it it brings in some notion of rationality um, um, that we can use in in thinking about human action. Um, we can speak of some actions as rational, um, some actions as contrary to reason or irrational. Um, you know, if someone who wills the end fails to will the necessary means, they're acting irrationally. Um, so we we seem to have some um, principles that Kant's philosophy has yielded up that that can be used to um, that articulate our understanding of rationality in, in action. Um, but I hadn't, um, and, oh, and I can mention also the um, one big step that was taken in the um, uh, in the recovery of Kant's practical philosophy when Rawls um, introduced the idea of constructivism as a as a a way of describing the Kantian approach um, to distinguish it not only from like the sentimentalist or moral sense philosophers of of, um, of Anglophone um, history, but also the rational intuitionist philosophers that um, they were generally opposing themselves to. So um, Rawls wanted to distinguish Kant's um, practical philosophy from the rational intuitionist, which he thought it was often confused with by saying, um, no, we're not, Kant is not a, um, a rationalist in the sense of one who thinks that we have certain intuitions of a realm of values, as Rawls would put it, um, that are somehow there, out there in things, in the nature of things, or who knows how exactly we're to understand that. But um, it's not as though we have a special kind of power of intuition to grasp these re these realities or these goods, these goods in themselves, perhaps, um, and then to bring them into application. Uh, the intuitions may have thought something like that, but um, in Kant's practical philosophy, it's rather um, an idea of construction, constructing principles or, or, or rules that we can, can live by on the basis of a shared conception of the person that we take for granted in our deliberate, in our practical joint deliberations. So there's a, um, a kind of a, um, um, an idea of practical philosophy that begins with a, a self-conception, our understanding of ourselves as persons, and then works out from that um, an account of principles that we can live by um, that are suited to the interaction, the coexistence of persons with one another. So we think about you know, what, what our understanding of a person is um, that doesn't presuppose that we're intuiting some metaphysical idea of a person, but just um, working with our intuitive understanding and then using our shared intellectual powers to to um, to settle on principles that we can can live by. Um, so that's a kind of um, picture of the use of reason that's um, suited to determine our action together. Um, but it doesn't go so far as to characterize this use as cognitive. Um, Rawls and most of his um, followers tend to think of this constructivist uh, conception as one um, that's rational, but um, they'll tend to um, shy away from speaking of it as, as knowledge. And for many years, um, I similarly just did not use knowledge in um, in speaking of Kant's practical philosophy, but um, it began to kind of gradually sink in <laughs> that Kant is himself um, quite freely and openly speaking of this kind of practical use of the intellect as cognitive. Um, and as it began to um, um, begin to sink in, um, I began to realize that um, there was a lot that could be done with this, the appreciation of this, this, um, this insight into the way Kant is thinking about the practical use of the intellect. And here I was probably advantaged over some other people who draw on Kant by the fact that I had been kind of preoccupied with the relation between Kant's theoretical and his practical philosophy from a very early point. My dissertation was on uh, the relation between the theoretical and the practical uh, 
um, um, philosophy in Kant. So I was um, for 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 some time been thinking about how reasons principle of sufficient reason and the theoretical use has a kind of application of practical use. So I was sort of primed, you might say, uh, to to um, take seriously Kant's talk of um, practical reasoning as cognitive in character. And when it and when it finally kind of got through my thick head that that's what was going on, um, doors began to swing open, and um, the book is um, what um, what uh, eventually emerged. So I think that um, this same resistance to thinking of reason as having a practical cognitive use also in in uh, impeded the interpretation of Kant. It's a it's a big job. Um, the 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 philosophy is enormously deep and and rich, and had been lost sight of for quite a you know quite a number of decades in in Anglophone philosophy, and the recovery of uh, an understanding of it, um, as I've now seen, can take you know um, a generation or two or more. It's it's a slow slow ongoing prog process. I think that Rawls and his students made a big step by introducing the idea of constructive use of reason as a kind of distinctive practical way in which it can be used. Um, but I think that we can also go um, this extra step, as Kant already had a long time ago, uh, and think of this use as straight out cognitive, as, as, um, as we all along have thought it to be in our ordinary pre-philosophical thinking. Before we put our philosopher's cats on, we talk about ourselves as knowing what to do. So just recovering that is um, the primary next step, I think, um, that that um, I saw myself as taking in not the the the, um, the book. That was really interesting. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, I guess there were a lot of components there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I think there's probably uh, a lot of overlap with this next question, because in these next couple questions, we're sort of getting to the some of this work of recovery and how you as a reader of Kant built toward that. Uh, so the first question uh, in this sort of question about the work of recovery or reading um, Kant uh, deals with his relationship to the ancients, right? And how reading or noticing that or fully appreciating that shapes it. So to read the question, uh, so in your work, you've argued that we should see Kant as giving the fullest modern expression to ancient and ancient practical cognitive view and ethics, uh, one also held by Plato and Aristotle. Uh, of course, you know, Socrates and all. Uh, so many other readings of Kant would understand him as giving a modern expression uh, well, of a distinctively modern view. Uh, so what are the stakes of this dispute about how we situate Kant historically? Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned earlier the um, the initial tendency on the part of the two developments in um, recent, relatively recent moral, Anglophone moral philosophy, um, namely the Kantian constructivists and the um, and the neo Aristotelian um, virtue ethicists. The tendency on their part to initially to view themselves as opposed to one another, um, their their um, their respective heroes, and um, were separated by you know two millennia. Um, that's a huge difference in time. Um, the whole sweep of the Middle Ages, Christianity, all kinds of things happened between the time of Plato and Aristotle and the in the 18th century uh, in which Kant um, um, developed his views. Um, so it's not to be expected uh, that um, there's going to be a kind of a seamless continuity. Um, there's, I think, um, um, good, reason to, I mean, it's it's not difficult to understand why 
the uh, Kant was viewed as so different from Aristotle in these early phases. Uh, one, <laughs> one factor which can't be ignored is that Kant tended to present his own philosophy as revolutionary. So he himself is making out that um, he um, is putting philosophy sort of on a new footing. Uh, that's seen already in the first critique in the idea of a, um, you know, a Copernican revolution in philosophy, um, an attempt to criticize all of traditional metaphysics and to put back in, in, in on its proper footing metaphysics as a kind of um, science, but under certain restricted conditions. Um, and we find it um, that in his practical philosophy, there's a similar um, presentation of the doctrines as new in a comparably radical way. Uh, now we're told that autonomy is the principle of morality and that this has been overlooked by the entire history of practical philosophy. So um, Kant is giving readers ample reason to think that he at least supposes that he is doing something completely different from all traditional philosophy, um, theoretical and practical. So how, um, how can I then <laughs> um, go on about how he's part of a, a tradition that reaches back to Plato and Aristotle? Well, um, I think that there, there is something that Kant, uh, I, you know, I want to acknowledge that there is something that Kant I think is onto that was perhaps never as clearly articulated in any antecedent to him um, as he articulates in his own views, this idea of autonomy as the basis of, of morality. That is something one can't really see um, advanced, identified, celebrated among any of the ancient philosophers in the way that Kant um, presents it. So, um, that is a real difference. But I think of this as um, a matter, primarily a matter of Kant putting, so to speak, two and two together or assembling certain insights that um, were, were understood earlier. And you can find um, indications, um, clear indications that philosophers like Plato and Aristotle recognized um, these points that Kant was seizing on, but that they never quite combined them into a single idea of autonomy in the way that Kant did. We find, for example, in Plato, in his account of justice in the, in the, in the Republic, um, a characterization of the just person as um, one who rules himself. That's how Plato puts it. There's a notion of self-rule in the account of the just soul and the just man. Uh, and we could say the uh, city, although that's maybe um, not to the point here. Um, so um, there are hints of a kind of self-regulation that run through the whole tradition, and you can see them as far back as in Socrates and Plato. Um, what we don't find is um, an, a, a spelling out of the the content of this self-rule or self-legislation, as Kant put it, uh, that, that brings in the idea of universal law and has um, the use of um, kind of a logical account of reasoning um, um, worked into it. That, that, those pieces didn't all get put together before Kant, as far as, I'm, as, far as I know. And um, that, um, forceful presentation of these um, ideas in their interconnection that Kant um, offers us um, is sufficiently arresting to make it easily understandable how, you know, now generations of, of interpreters have seen him as presenting something quite, quite different. And he's helping them along by saying that it's quite different. Um, but I, but I think that the, um, even Kant's celebration of the of this idea of autonomy, it needs to be taken 
I mean, with a little bit of uh, maybe a grain of salt, or a little, it should be qualified a little bit because when he when he describes the the ancients um, who fail to to um, to recognize this autonomy, um, he tends to cite um, the Hellenistic philosophers, the, the Epicureans, and the uh, and the Stoics. He's curiously silent about Plato and Aristotle. Um, and why that's so is not easy to, to say. Um, it does seem as though Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's practical philosophy was largely unknown to Kant except secondhand. I can't find any clear evidence that Kant actually read, um, say, Aristotle's ethics. Um, what he says about Aristotle's ethics seems to be picked up from um, textbooks or histories or re re remarks by the philosophers. Um, he did read some Plato, and I think he was enormously impressed by Plato. And I believe that some of the um, strikingly Kantian features of Kant's practical philosophy are um, are the the fruit of his of his careful study of some of Plato's dialogues. So I think that if we compare Kant to Plato rather than Aristotle, we have a better way of understanding how there is this continuity. Um, I think of Aristotle and Kant as two students, so to speak, of a common um, mentor um, more than a, a, as um, themselves in the first instance, the two points of comparison. Um, and, and in that way, I think it's easier to see, see the, the connections. Um, um, so that's, that's, that's a start. I, I, I don't know whether I'm fully early addressing the, all this behind your question. One thing that's impeded modern, I think, interpretations as well of Kant is, is that, um, the Anglophone readership, um, you know, in trying to assimilate this strange Teutonic figure, uh, uh, they 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 reach for um, points uh, uh, in the in the view which they can connect up with what they are familiar with, and so the examples um, of uh, in the first section of the groundwork in which Kant discusses duty and moral worth um, are examples that are the easiest for an Anglophone philosopher to digest because these examples are um, not presented um, as first person um, reflections, but rather as invitations to consider what we would say about someone we're encountering um, um, in life. So we, we were presented with an example of someone who say a shopkeeper, or someone who is very generous and wants to help others. Um, and we're asked, you know, um, how we judge the actions that they perform um, under a certain description that Kant provides us. So we're we're adopting the point of view of the of the moral spectator, the the point of view that Hume, Adam Smith, other um, modern philosophers, moral philosophers, um, Anglophone moral philosophers of Kant's day would have adopted. And that that kind of third person point of view is what's been prominent in Anglophone ethics ever since. So that's those are the parts of Kant's ethics that, that the Anglophone readership tends to glom onto and to puzzle over because Kant says such peculiar things. <laughs> um, and, and so there's a, um, a kind of obsession with those, those examples. And um, the, um, the um, you know, the, the, the dialectic has generally been Kant as against, say, a more Humean or moral sense approach. Um, that's guided the, 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 um, the Anglophone thinking um, as opposed to um, comparisons with, with the antiquity. That's, an, that's another dimension to the, um, to the um, um, way in which Kant is not thought of as uh, continuous with, with the, um, the broadly Aristotelian tradition. Though, if I can mention one other thing here um, on this, um, that has encouraged me over the years to stick with this idea that Kant and Aristotle are, are broadly speaking, on the same page. 
And that is that there's a, a long uh, tradition, as we all know, of Aristotelian philosophy, theoretical and practical, that ran through the um, uh, medieval times. Aquinas is you know, maybe the great, the great figure um, in that tradition, but there were many others. And um, what happened in the modern era is that the scholastic philosophy got largely dropped, um, viewed as completely inadequate for understanding the, the modern science. And that tended to be accompanied by a, a rejection of, of um, the, um, the scholastic Aristotelian ethical thinking as well, since it drew, you employed concepts that were becoming suspect um, in the same way that the um, concepts employed in scholastic theoretical philosophy were becoming suspect, the whole the whole you know the whole program was 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 thrown out by and large by the early modern philosophers. Nobody wanted to be associated with with Aristotle or the scholastics. Even Kant talks that way. He does not want people to think of him as a scholastic. But there's one really striking exception to this. Uh, and that is Leibniz. Um, um, of all the ma major modern philosophers, Leibniz is the one person who really um, appreciated the value of certain concepts in, in the Platonic Aristotelian uh, scholastic tradition. And he frequently advocated or you know, um, um, admonished his, his modern colleagues to to uh, not to throw the baby out with the bath, so to speak. And so, um, you know, concepts like substance, like, um, or, or like entelechia or uh, substantial call, substantial form, concepts that um, have um, a certain um, distinctive involvement of, um, or they, 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 they bring in, to our attention, the idea of a kind of activity which is its own end, um, um, something like um, uh, the ongoing life activity of, a, of an animal or a plant. This is something that did not really get much press in the physical study of nature in the early modern period. But Leibniz saw that it; uh, these were concepts of great importance and you might say because of his enormous influence on the continent, if not in 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 the isles, um, there was a more greater willingness to take seriously scholastic thinking, at least in the German um, philosophical tradition in the 17th and 18th centuries, 18th especially. So, Kant himself was raised. Um, in an environment where a lot of old scholastic ideas were still in, in vogue under the protection of Leibniz, um, scholastic philosophy survived in Germany uh, in a way that it didn't in other parts of Europe. And that helped Kant, I think, to, um, you might say, um, just absorb certain scholastic and Aristotelian ways of thinking um, you know, like his mother's milk, he's just, without really knowing it, he's taking on um, some of these distinctions, some of these ideas, and we can see them right there on the page of his philosophy, the appeal to faculties, the distinction between form and matter, it's all over in Kant, um, the distinction between theoretical and practical. Um, these are all broadly Aristotelian um, um, ideas, and Kant works with them um, without any comment. He just seems to be completely at home with them. So much so that it's easy for, you know, for Anglophone readers nowadays to think, well, yeah, that was just the, the lingo that Kant was raised in. And so he works with it, but um, you have to look past that to find the exciting new ideas. Um, that's just the, you know the um, the old skins. We have to find the new wine, um, and 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 uh, and not be distracted by this terminology. But around the time I begin to take seriously the idea that um, Kant does really mean practical knowledge when he says it, um, I I begin to appreciate that these these other terms like form and matter um, are used by Kant um, 
in a completely straightforward way. He's um, they're they're load bearing concepts in his philosophy, and so the, this this also helped me enormously in thinking through what is up with Kant. He he um, is much easier to see as belonging to this tradition if you take seriously as opposed to just ignoring the talk, the jargon, so to speak, of of form and matter and um, theoretical and practical and so on. So I, um, fighting one's way into, or fighting maybe isn't the word, but just a, a, a acclimating oneself to the, the movement of his thinking, um, the, the, um, the, the, the deeper, um, the deeper, the deeper um, order of ideas. Um, it takes time, but as uh, but as it happens, one begins to see um, his philosophy in a quite different um, light, and and uh, it, the the connection with with um, antiquity is is um, becomes just undeniable. At least it seems to me, anyway. <laughs> I appreciate that. That was a wonderfully rich, thorough answer. Uh, I've done a lot of things I was interested in. So. Good. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's not great. Yeah. Uh, so um, I guess this last question brings us back to a topic which you touched upon, I think, uh, uh, in your answer to a, the not the just the immediately last question, but two questions ago. And that is the connection between uh, Kant's theoretical and his practical philosophy. Um, so I'll, I'll read the question. Um, so you've been cited by uh, some contemporary philosophers, uh, such as James Conant and Sebastian Rudel, in support of what, what some might consider a heterodox reading of the theoretical philosophy or something. Um, could you characterize some of what may make your reading of the theoretical philosophy distinct and how your reading of the practical philosophy is shaped by that? Um, well, I suppose uh, that the the leading thought here uh, would be the um, the feature of Kant that I was just um, referring to a moment ago, the the um, tendency to think of um, to carry out his analytical uh, treatments of his topics in terms of an analysis um, informed by the concepts of form and matter, uh, the the hylomorphism. Um, I'm not sure whether that's what's behind these descriptions, but um, that would likely be one factor at least. Um, if, um, if there's another, um, it might be the, um, the Copernican way of thinking, but I'll, I'll start with the hylomorphism and, um, and we can stay there or move um, further if you, if you care to. So I, um, I have um, found it um, again, a kind of a, to be a, a breakthrough in understanding Kant to um, finally just take seriously his use of these terms form and matter. Uh, he characterizes the um, between the intellect and the senses or understanding and sensibility in these terms. The understanding he says is form, the senses or sensibility is matter. Um, and as he understands the, the hylomorphic distinction, um, he puts it beautifully at one point. Um, he says that a matter is the determinable and form is its determination. Um, that's all he says, just that one little sentence. But if you reflect upon it, you can see that is built into that characterization of form and matter that each of these terms uh, cannot be understood in isolation from the other. The matter is the determinable. So 
to be determinable is implies a reference to form determination of it and form as the determination of it cannot be thought separately from the matter that it's the determination of so each r each of these terms is locked in relation to the other um and yet in a way that does seem to implicate a certain kind of order between them um the order of the determining and what's determined uh and that's kind of that that introduces a sort of puzzlement in the minds of readers because we tend to think of what of 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 talk of determination as implying that the things that are so related or must be distinct from one another a determines b um b must be separate from a um if b is determined by a we tend to think in those in those terms and so there's a um a pressure to think of form and matter as distinct and yet there's also um, the way they're characterized by Kant, um, a requirement that they be thought of as interdependent. Um, and um, um, I think that this, this, this description bears a lot of reflection and um, I think I'm still working on it. And I think that I have a ways to go before I've touched bottom, but but I think that it um, it's um, it brings with it an idea of of this determining relation, which can be um, one between different things, as um, always involving a kind of um, um, immediacy of relatedness, such that um, the the determination is itself one thing that can be described in two different ways or two different aspects um it's sort of like, um, um you know if if if, if a x b um there's an action there's a there's a there's an action that a performs and then there's an effect b um gets kicked but the being kicked and the kicking are not two different things so the same thing there's just one there's just one um action in 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 question here the kicking but it can be described um, from two ends, you know, like an active and passive voice difference. Um, there's one thing, but with two different kinds of description. And we tend to think of them as want to pull them apart um, and think of, you know, along Humean lines and think of the effect uh, of the cause as one effect, one event, say, and the and the effect as another event, two separate things that could um, exist independently of one another. But Kant is thinking of causality and determination in a way that um is completely different from that from that human um in, in kind of empirical um hold on on causation and determination so um this this um uh this idea of determine the of, of form as determining matter as determin determinable um um i take to be um then the terms or the, the the notion this contrast is, is the one that I have tried to use to understand how the intellect or the understanding and sensibility are related to one another. And what, um, if you continue to reflect upon this idea and what it, what it, what it confronts you with is the thought that um, uh, the relation between sensibility and its deliverances, intuitions, and the understanding and its concepts the relation that they must stand in in order for us to have cognition isn't the relation that we would maybe naively suppose if we um, enter philosophy as empiricists, um, thinking that somehow, um, and this is, you know, in antiquity, this is how it all started, um, the senses receive impressions, and those impressions are then picked up by the understanding, and it's somehow these impressions that shape our concepts. Uh, it doesn't go that way at all in Kant's thinking. Uh, it's rather that um, the um, the sensible intuitions we have are informed by the uh, the understanding. So um, it's the intellect that determines sensibility rather than sensibility determining the intellect. That's um, you know it, it here's a respect in which Kant, although he's I, as I've been saying, part of a scholastic vision goes quite against what we um, 
often associate with the scholastic um, view, um, the kind of the empiricist side of scholasticism in any way that sees the senses as giving us the forms initially and and somehow having having determining or shaping the um, the uh, um, the involvement of the of the understanding. So, um, um, you know, scores of commentators on Kant's epistemology um, scratch their heads and um, turn the pages of the text looking for some way of understanding his view on which, yes, intuitions somehow do um, enable our concepts to have a kind of contact with, with, with reality, with the things that affect us uh, through the senses. They look and they high and low trying to find some um, evidence that Kant, yes, he really is thinking that intuition somehow constrain or determine our concepts so that we can be in touch in our thinking with the way things are. Very familiar, um, and it's going on today um, still very robustly, um, uh, but I think that this is um, just a kind of a hangover, you might say, or just a holdover, maybe I'll put it less contentiously, uh, of the standard kind of Anglophone, broadly Humean empiricist um, predilections that inform the interpretations of Kant's theoretical philosophy. And uh, in order to escape the predicament that this interpretation is in, um, you have to take the next step, which I alluded to a moment ago, which is to um, go Copernican and appreciate that the objects um, that we know are not there independently um, formed already in complete independence in isolation from um, the capa their capacity to be known. Um, that's that's something that um, when you start to think about it, that 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 assumption, when you start to think about it, um, becomes increasingly difficult to make sense of. Although before you really think about it, it seems obviously true, and so everybody tends to. Um, it just it seems as though almost everybody, you know, as as they start reading Kant, assume that he must in the end, if his if his account of of theoretical knowledge is to be viable, something we can take seriously, he must in the end allow that the the impressions of the senses and the intuitions that are formed um, by sensibility or somehow insensibility are um, guiding or somehow um, constraining our um, our, th our thoughts and our judgments about about nature and reality. Uh, that's that's um, I think a huge, perhaps the biggest, I think by far the biggest impediment to getting inside of what's going on in Kant's theoretical wow. philosophy. One needs to um, reflect upon the Copernican way of thinking and reach a point where one sees that it's obvious. There's no other way. Um, um, you have to sort of just take the step to recognize that the things that we're trying to know in theoretical judging and thinking are, of course, knowable things. We're not trying to know things that aren't knowable or thinking of them as things who knows whether they're knowable. Um, the only thing that we can have as an aim in cognition is things, the grasping of which will vindicate the idea of them as knowable. Um, we'll have the knowledge that we are tacitly supposing is possible in respect of them. So secretly behind the scenes, you might say, in our attempt to understand nature is this presumption that it's knowable, that there's some point to the activity, the, the exertions of um, that we in, um, go, um, the, the exertion we go to, to to comprehend what we encounter through the senses, there's some point to it all, that there's some, some, um, some possibility of attaining the knowledge that we're seeking. So we're, we're always starting with an idea of, of the objects as in principle knowable. And if they're in principle knowable, they must have a relation to the capacity to know them. And that's the capacity we're exercising in our investigation of them. So, 
um, there's an internal relation between the objects and the capacity to know that's there from the ground up in Kant's thought, and that's just being expressed in the Copernican way of thinking. Um, that these are well, I mean, it, it's it's inflected slightly by uh, the Copernican way of thinking to accommodate the, our understanding that we can know something about them a priori. Um, that there's a certain character they must have as um, the knowable things that they are. Um, reflecting upon our capacity to know brings us uh, to the awareness that there are certain conditions that have to be satisfied um, by these objects for them to be the knowable things that they are. Um, they need to be related to other things that can be known. Um, and we can add, you know, they have to be in, um, encountable by us in space and time. So he's simply fleshing out um, the um, things that we can say in advance about the objects that we try to know. But it all starts with the idea that they are knowable things. And to the extent that we have a priori knowledge of them, they must be such as to conform to our knowledge. And that's the Copernican way of thinking. So um, once you kind of reflect reflect on the um, the um, what's implicit in our in our in our theoretical judging, uh, you I think can reach a point where the Copernican way of thinking is it just comes with the territory. Um, once you understand what it is to theoretically judge and the way in which these judgments presuppose certain a priori under, bits of understanding. So that maybe that's what they had in mind, um, but that's certainly, I guess I've, I've given you an answer now that brought in the Copernican way of thinking along with the hylomorphism. They're all one big package. Yes, thank you for that. That was extremely rich. And um, in fact, it, um, if I may, and it's also okay if you would prefer that we move on, um, I would like to make it sort of a brief follow-up to that response. Um, and so you speak of sort of the importance of appreciating the unity of form and matter when we're understanding, for example, what it means, and maybe I'm already stepping out of this way of thinking the way I'm about to phrase it, the way that the understanding relates to sensibility, for example. And I think, you know, throughout your book, you use uh, the term like our rational capacity for knowledge, our capacity to know. And I think one may be struck by uh, how distinct th this way of talking is from a way that is maybe more familiar in a textbook presentation of Kant's philosophy, where it's almost as if um, uh, the, the different cognitive faculties, as it were, stand to one another as the different parts of an assembly line relate to one another, where, as it were, one has the sensibility and then the imagination and the understanding and whatever, where it seems as if these are self-standingly intelligible and they each produce something on their own, which are then, as it were, handed up to the next rung of cognition. And uh, so I suppose maybe this is more of a comment than a question. I suppose the way I may phrase this in a question is, um, it seems as if the barrier to understanding things in the way that you do in your book and the um, way you did in your answer just now, where we don't speak of things in this kind of heavily psychologized, maybe empiricist key, is uh, an appreciation of form and matter, the appreciation of their, uh, the unity being logically prior to their being distinct. Would you say that's correct? Yeah, absolutely. There's um, the, um, the, um, you know, Anglophone philosophers um, often, you know, are, are really um, hostile to psychologizing the topics in philosophy. And, um, you know, Frege, going back to the beginnings of it all, um, is a prime example of this sort of um, um, animus against psychologizing. Um, it's a funny thing. You find an equally... Um, um, emphatic rejection of all psychology in Kant's philosophy as well. And yet, ironically or curiously, um, contemporary Anglophone philosophers view his philosophy as very psychologistic. Um, all this talk of faculties and, uh, and mental acts and operations looks like it's somehow psychological. Well, in some broad sense, of course it is. Um, it's the mind or what used to be called psuche, soul, um, that's under investigation. And so we're studying it. Um, that's the logos of psuche, the psychology, um, the, the, uh, the study of the, of the, the mind in, in operation and its cognitive uh, um, 
uh, capacity. Uh, so what's um, so if if um, if if a philosopher is hostile to to all of that, then um, he's or he she is going to be hostile to what Kant is up to. But um, usually, I think what's what's meant is uh, is a kind of aversion to a certain empiricized uh, attempt to uh, engage with questions of philosophy. Certainly, that's what Frege was um, principally concerned with. He saw the um, the, um, the 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 late nineteenth century um, German philosophy that um, was trafficking in in Forstellung and um, representations, ideas, um, um, uh, lowercase i. Um, he saw them as, and these were Kantians actually. Um, that he he saw this as largely a kind of a um, kind of a the last gasp, you might say, of Kant's thinking. Um, it's turned into a sort of a study of of the mental mental um, operations, occurrences, and so on, and that's um, that's something that Kant is equally, I think, opposed to. Uh, so what what we need to um, appreciate is that um, the investigation of the cognitive activity not be by way of a kind of introspective. Um, survey of the contents of the mind. Maybe there's a kind of running together of what we find in Hume with what we find in Kant. There's perhaps to a you know cursory read of these philosophers, um, an, e an easy confusion that can be can be made it can seem as though Kant and Hume are doing kind of the same thing. And indeed it's striking how similar um, much of Kant is to Hume. Uh, and so I don't want to deny that you can go quite a long way um, um, by and see them on in agreement on a strikingly wide range of topics. It's it's uncanny actually, but nevertheless, in Kant there's a um, a kind of a um, uh, uh, um, um, a a, um, a single-minded. Um, adherence or cleaving to the the subject the position of the subject that's um, doing the knowing or engaged in the cognitive activity we're always reflecting from the point of view or as this knowing subject in articulating analytically an account of our activity that draws into uh, our consideration powers um, um, that stand in these hylomorphic relations to one another. So we're always starting with the act. And in Kant's case, it's the act of judgment. We're always starting there, and it is completely unitary. Um, it is, um, um, and this is one of the points I, I emphasize in the book, uh, uh, the, the act of judgment is um, has a kind of unity that is such that None of the, although it has components, um, different concepts are brought into play in the act of judgment. They're all um, brought into a, a joint use, uh, which is such that each of the component elements, the use of each of them, uh, depends upon the use of all the others. Uh, this is true of any thought. Um, there's a kind of inter interrelatedness of all the elements in the act uh, that that is completely inseparable. And the, then the analysis of the capacity to engage in this kind of activity has to be, um, if it's you know going to be viable, it has to um, not lose sight of the fact that the activity we began with has this unity. So if you want to distinguish different capacities that are presupposed in the act of judgment, you have to hold on to the thought that they must be so related as to not preclude the possibility of the item that we were trying to understand in the first place, the judgment. So, so um, the, the drawing into uh, the account of powers of the mind or faculties, um, and Kant goes quite a ways um, there, you know, there's the imagination along with sensibility, there's the outer sense, inner sense, um, the higher faculty understanding has different um, moments, some um, understanding, judgment, reason. A lot of players are soon on the stage but there, you um, you one needs to understand all of these um, as part of a unitary power to know. That's the place he begins the critique of pure reason. 
and he never leaves it. The faculty of knowing. At Kentness for Mergen is the place he starts, and that's just the power to know. And knowing has this unity, so the power must have the unity, and then we begin to distinguish within it aspects, um, component powers. So yeah, I'm um, um, I'm um, entirely um, in in uh, agreement with those others who who want to emphasize um, the um, um, the need to keep um, the account of the powers uh, um, in. Uh, account of in the account of these powers, one needs to keep them in internal relations to one another. That's that's um, that's critical, um, and that the same point applies on the practical side. Although we don't tend to spend as much time analyzing these acts in practical philosophy as we do in theoretical, one of the things that I've found really illuminating is seeing how far one can go carrying out an analytical account of practical thinking um, that complements the account of theoretical thinking in Kant. Uh, and so you've noticed, I think, in the book that I distinguish between, say, the capacity to, to feel enjoyment in the agreeable as a kind of um, receptivity for the power of practical knowledge, um, a kind of parallel to intuition and sensibility on the theoretical side. That will then um, operate in, in in concert with the with the practical intellect. So there's a similar kind of um, point to be made in the practical use that I to the one I just made uh, regarding the theoretical use. And then of course there's also going to be a need to hold these two different accounts together, because practical practical reasoning and theoretical reasoning also are integral integrally related to one another although there are some subtle points that need to be appreciated there but there's a, a deep connection and we don't want to have these two floating off <laughs> separate from one another either yeah well that was really wonderful thank you for that um and i think we'll now move on to some more specific themes from the book which um i think nate has the first question there. well i suppose this one uh could as easily have been uh earlier but um so uh, earlier, we discussed Kant as, you know, I think the way you put it was this, you know, student of Plato, and then, you know, Kant, they shared a master with, uh, shared a master with Aristotle, uh, but he would be an exponent of this practical reason view in ethics. Um, now, there are, of course, points of disagreement within this practical reason tradition. Um, there are, you know, points of originality in Kant, of course. Uh, so, You've already touched on some of this, but um, maybe in a more focused or like a narrow way almost. Uh, could you roughly characterize some of Kant's contributions to disputes within this tradition? Uh, so, for example, his conception of the highest good uh, or the will's autonomy? Uh, yeah, um, I've already said a word about autonomy. Um, and let me just add. Um, Quickly, a point or two about flesh that out a little bit, and then I'll then I'll turn to the highest good, um, which um, um, although it is distinctive of Kant's practical philosophy um, when we compare him to other moderns and contemporary philosophers, he's pretty much the only one who you know has gives much truck to the idea of the highest good and he himself remarks on that that modern philosophers tend not to pay any attention to the highest good anymore whereas for him it's an extremely important notion and it's a it's actually a one of the telltale signs that he has um, um that the ancients are much more um closer proximity to his thinking than than we tend to tend to think but the the thing i want to just mention regarding autonomy um is that uh, the um the the account of it that i was presenting in the book um takes us departure from the third of the three famous formulas which involves this idea of a kind of universal self-legislation the idea that um the the form of practical cognition 
um, the, the condition of the validity of our practical judgments is that they be such that um, they could be universally acted upon um, and universally agreed upon by all sub potential actors as um, as principles for the, for everyone to act upon. So there's a kind of double universality that's um, implicit in Kant's talk of universal self-legislation. Um, the legislation is universal and it's universally shared or, or, or shared, shared in. So we're all legislating for everyone and everyone's in the business, as I just said, of, of that universal legislation. That's, um, that's I mean, that that comes across as a kind of modern idea. We think of maybe Rousseau in this connection, the idea of a general will. Um, the other mo main modern philosopher along with Kant who, who really got this idea kind of on, put it on the map. Um, more recently, we see it in something that Rawls and, and Scanlon's contractualist um, account of, um, uh, of moral obligation. The, the This idea is very much alive. So it's, um, it's a, it's you might say it's a distinctively Kantian idea, but what I want to what I want to just say um, I'm already getting overly long winded here, but the, these two ideas of universality, um, although they're brought together in Kant's account, um, you can find them separately uh, in the ancients. So you, if you look at what Aristotle says, for example, about um, goods, uh, people who are good, um, good men, you know he'll say, um, um, they are in agreement with one another. Um, bad men tend to fall into disagreement. So conflict is associated with bad people. Agreement is associated with good people. And if you pay careful attention to what Aristotle says about this agreement, you see he has in mind both kinds of agreement that I distinguished and that are clearly in play in Kant's thinking. There's both agreement um, of the sort that um, um, obtains when different people are doing the same kind of thing in the same kind of circumstances, and also the agreement that different people can be involved in when they agree that of, of a particular person that that's what they should do. Um, the first was objective agreement, as I called it, and the second subjective agreement. You find Aristotle saying that good people agree in both of these sorts of ways. Um, he doesn't put it, you know, quite as explicitly, that, but he you can see he's thinking of both kinds of agreement. He just doesn't put them all together in a single package. Um, um, but if he had, voila, there it would be um, the idea of a kind of, um, and if we, if we thought of that as a condition of cognition as well, then he would be um, already where, where Kant is. Um, so um, so this, th these two ideas of universality are not at all controversial. Um, you can even find Hume accepting both of them. Even, you know, an empiricist like Hume accepts that um, if a tr if judgment's going to be true, it must be such that everyone could agree upon agree with it. And he also agrees that uh, in his discussion of causal reasoning, at least, that um, if um, if you know something causes something else under certain conditions, and anything else that causes something else under those same conditions, if it's the same kind of thing, the same kind of things involved, will 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 it'll be the same uh, the same the same rule could be applied. And that's that's the objective universality. So Hume accepts that too. So um, it's, you know, these two kinds of universality just run through the tradition. Um, they're uncontroversial. Kant just brought them all together um, as jointly comprising a single condition for cognition. Um, um, all right, so, so his contribution then is to kind of draw from our what we already understand, um, draw into a kind of unity um, truths that are already recognized, um, scattered about in the in the um, in in the among his predecessors. But as for the highest good, um, this too is indeed a distinctive feature of Kant, but one that I think of as um, as I was saying, um, uh, a nice point of comparison with the ancients, uh, and. Initially, it poses a kind of obstacle to seeing the continuity because Kant, of course, thinks of the ancients as all having a conception of the highest good. Well, he's there's a bit of um, he says different things, and um, um, there's a difficult 
matter of sorting out what his real view is of his relation to the ancients. But, but in the most prominent places, he will tend to describe the ancients as all being eudaimonists, um, which is to say they all think of the highest good as an object that is not informed, a, a sort of a non-Copernican object, you might say, an object that's not already um, conceived as an object that could be known practically. Um, somehow we glom on to this as philosophers, we can identify something that's good, and then we um, try to form rules of action that um, will enable us most effectively to advance or promote that good. Um, that that conception of eudaimonism is um, certainly very vulnerable to Kant's criticisms of it. I think um, that th that I regard as relatively um, hard to deny. However, what Kant doesn't say is that, um, and this is partly maybe reflects the fact that he doesn't talk very much about Aristotle or Plato. He doesn't mention how they think of the highest good. Uh, and if 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 we um, were to ourselves look at their view of eudaimonia, their 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 word for the for the what Kant calls the summum bonum or the highest good, uh, we find that they think of virtue as already part of the package. It's built in. I mean, Aristotle says explicitly that no one would, he doesn't think anybody would think this actually, that, that the highest good could um, be without virtue, no, no courage, no, no wisdom, no, no temperance, um, um, th th any, any condition uh, that lacked those virtues couldn't, couldn't count as the highest good. So he's already, already um, got a conception of the highest good that's informed ethically. And that's something that Kant does not register in his discussion of the ancients. He recognizes that you could start with the conception of the highest good that is thus informed, and that's in fact what he himself does, um, but he doesn't um, consider that perhaps Aristotle might be the philosopher who, who shares that conception of the highest good. So um, when you read more closely the accounts that Kant offers and that Aristotle offers of, of the summum bonum, you find that uh, they both think of the end as ethically inflected, you might say. And this, um, I think, protects Aristotle from the charge uh, that Kant raises against him of being uh, having a heteronomy. Well, he doesn't single out Aristotle, but the, the charge of heteronomy. Uh, he, Aristotle does not need to be read as, as having, some interpreters may read him that way, but it's not, I think, in the in the in the in the thought itself. Not as I understand it anyway. That's great. I, I appreciate that. I yeah. Yeah. And it's great the next question. Yeah, thank you. I guess um, this next question touches on a more specific theme in your book, which is your reading of the universalization test and the groundwork. Um, so um, in that in your book, your um, I guess one way of stating your argument about the universalization test is that it ought to be read as expressing Ex making explicit the relationship between the form of a maxim and its content. And um, of course, this contrasts with a widespread tendency in the reception of Kant's moral philosophy to read the universalization test in terms of some type of means end or prudential reasoning. So um, I suppose this is, was, at least to me, a particularly interesting aspect of your book, and in particular, your reading of the groundwork. So I wanted to ask, um, a couple questions related to it, and you may, of course, uh, answer them in the order you wish. Um, so how does your view of the universalization test change the general picture of Kant as a moral philosopher? Um, and how does it allow us uh, to overcome some of those central objections which have been raised to it in Anglophone philosophy? And of, of course, often by those who do see the universalization test in terms of means and or prudential reasoning. Yeah. Well, I think that um, uh, we, you know, we um, there. There's a lot that might be said here, um, and I think maybe 
without getting uh, too caught up in the particular readings that have been offered in the literature, uh, there's a, a general thing that I, I do want to say, uh, and that is that, and I think this point, um, I th think I make something like this point in the book. I'm not sure I remember for sure, but um, the, these, um, these interpretations of the universalization test that rely in some way on means and reasoning. Uh, it goes back a long way. I think I mentioned Mill as a prominent example, and he's very influential. That's, you know, that's a thing. He's, he says what he says at the very beginning of utilitarianism, which Anglophone ethicists have been you know, read, reading for now close to two, coming up on two centuries. So the, 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 before they turn to Kant, they get, they get this, um, um, preview of his thinking um, as a hopeless failure, um, so hopeless that um, he himself, in spite of himself, Kant himself has to reach for other um, considerations in order to make his universalization test work. Um, he's fudging, in other words. That's the implication, right? He's he's departing in in his um, actual comportment in the way he um, handles the examples from his official line about the um, the universalization test. Uh, so the the means end reasoning uh, has been a kind of a, a, a player in interpretations of Kant the, ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it was, I think, I think it, it, it started before Mill. I think Schopenhauer similarly um, reads Kant in this kind of a way. Uh, so it's going on kind of broadly at large. Um, and, and you see it even in the more, in some of the best recent literature on Kant's um, um, formula, formula of the universal law. Um, when I teach Kant's practical philosophy um, at the graduate level, um, I will tend to um, um, suggest students look at the, the paper by Christine Korsgaard, Kant's form of universal law, which is a very useful discussion um, in part because it presents the kind of the standard interpretive approaches to Kant's uh, formula and um, discusses in a, in a, you know, fair, in, in, a, in a helpful way, their, their strengths and weaknesses. Um, Korsgaard then offers her own favored um, reading. Um, um, it too, um, or it, it in any case does um, rely upon me, means and reasoning in a certain way. Uh, and um, I know when I was first thinking about the form of universal law, these were the, the, the candidates, the, the, op, you know, the options that were before me. So it's it's very familiar to me to, to think uh, that Kant is somehow relying, say, on the principle of hypothetical imperatives uh, in applying the, ca the the categorical imperative, the test. Uh, um, why not? I mean, why shouldn't we suppose that that kind of reasoning should be also a constraint? And for sure, it must be. Um, they're they're all conditions on sound judgments, um, but. Um, it's a the, the, to to bring in instrumental reasoning in the understanding of how the universalization is a, a, to be applied. It seems to be um, kind of bleeding of different uses of reason into one another, and I find it somehow intellectually unsatisfying to suppose that Kant or to to, to try to understand the the categorical requirement as somehow involving the instrumental or the hypothetical requirement. You would expect that a satisfying philosophical account would cleanly distinguish them and not uh, mix them up at all in the account of the two. And so I've always been somewhat unsatisfied with accounts that, that blur that and, and allow the one to, um, especially in the interpretation of Kant where he never suggests that he's doing anything like that, although people read him as, in fact, betraying that he is. So 
so I um, um, I find um, I find the the reliance upon instrumental forms of reasoning in spelling out the contradictions as intellectually unsatisfying is kind of it's somehow um, I don't know it's lack of philosophical hygiene or something. It just it's not a satisfying um, demarcation of the um, of the different forms of practical intellect. Um, if we if we um, allow um, our account of the one kind of con constraint as um, somehow involving the other. I mean, it could be that they bear some such relation. It's not as though there couldn't be a way in which the categorical builds on the hypothetical. So it, it's not unthinkable or that, that this might be a satisfactory interpretation or that even the Kant might himself think along those lines. And there's a way I think in which the, um, the, um, the, he is presupposing that the person who's got a maxim is a rational agent who does think in coherent instrumental terms. So I don't want to overstate this, um, but uh, for the test itself to um, uh, crucially um, deploy instrumental um, considerations strikes me as not the first place to reach. So I regard these instrumental readings as um, the, 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 the interpretations that draw on this as, in, as, as I mean, I take it as a reflection of um, a difficulty they're facing in understanding what the what the test is. Um, they, they can't understand it on its own uh, on its own terms, and so they they help themselves to some more requirements. Um, I think um, some of the main prominent Anglophone the, the students' roles, especially, tend to to do this. Um, not especially. I mean, you see it. I think very common, but you see in some of the most prominent re this tendency. And I, um, um, I, you know, I think that as Mill's remark um, kind of puts it well, they are signs of um, a kind of a some awareness that there's a problem here and we need to help ourselves by, by bringing in further things further further conditions further further requirements so i um i if we can avoid it all to the good and um i think that by introducing these other conditions in various ways um we just contribute to this general haze of of um skepticism about the whole idea of Kant's formulas and the, and the and their viability. There's a lot of skepticism about them, especially about the form of universal law. And the more um, it seems as though the interpretations of the, of, of the test um, wheel in extraneous considerations, the more it looks as though it's just a losing proposition. And they're just, you know, they're, 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 they're their hail marys or desperate moves of desperation to try to you know throw something at the wall and hope it'll stick, which is not a promising recipe for a satisfying interpretation of moral obligation. So I, I've tried to um, um, read Kant as he seems to want to be read as just giving us a straight, um, 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 uncluttered account of. A kind of contradiction that arises in maxims that are um, contrary to duty uh, that comes into view when we think of them in accordance with the implicit form they have as maxims, namely as universal universal laws. And it's much cleaner. Um, not that it's um, um, doesn't it call for some very abstract thinking which is not easy and it's <laughs> um easy not easy so it's not easy to articulate it in in a you know slick pithy one-liner but but um i think that the the overall account is much more satisfactory and much more in line with the way kant himself seems to be describing his account um than the interpretations that bring in the um the use of instrumental thinking so i um i I think of this as um, um, a reading that 
gives us a more, more satisfactory interpretation of what Kant's trying to do. And it's also philosophically, I think, more satisfying. And I hope also um, will be an aid to dissolving some of the skepticism about the whole project that's that's um, in vogue. And that, of course, philosophers are very um, ingenious in their um, um, uh, uh, in their attempts to these for existing accounts. And so <laughs> we'll see. But um, uh, that's the aspiration anyway, if that if that speaks to your question. Oh, it absolutely does. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think we have one last sort of um, pre-written question, which I'll, I think Nate will read. Yeah. Um, so this, in a way, brings us back to certain questions we were kind of touching on at the beginning, but I think also sort of brings things to a close nicely. Um, so we'd like to end with a theme that you discuss in the conclusion to your book, uh, and that's the relationship between Kant's moral philosophy and the practical purpose of moral philosophy. Um, so some philosophers, uh, you cite Bernard Williams, have challenged the idea that an enterprise as abstract as moral philosophy could ever help us to understand the messiness of real moral life. Now, one of your contentions is that Kant provides us a path for reconnecting moral philosophy with you know, pre-reflective moral lifers so every day. Uh, so could you provide maybe a rough characterization of that path and uh, maybe in that point to what Kant's answer to this sort of Williams' challenge yeah. to moral philosophy might be? Yeah. Um... That's that's a, a very good question. Um, um, <clears throat> this yeah, this brings us to the um, um, another source of concern uh, that that uh, the interpretation of Kant's philosophy. Um, often faces, uh, namely the sense that um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, I think, related to the, um, the view of Kant as a textbook deontologist, um, the, the, uh, the thought that there's some kind of very high level abstract reflection, philosophizing that's carried on here using these very thin concepts like obligation, um, good, bad, right, wrong, uh, that itself um, is maybe alienated from our, uh, of our ground level ethical thinking. Um, I was earlier pointing to the way in which Anglophone philosophy um, has become detached from, uh, alienated, I think I said, from ordinary first order ethical thinking. And um, you're rightly bringing up um, an Anglophone, one of the more prominent Anglophone philosophers of the last half century who raises something like that as Kant. Kant's whole approach and the, the whole institution, as Williams puts it, of uh, morality, um, um, moral philosophy as it's known, um, Kant is the exemplar of this approach. Um, utilitarianism is another big, huge player in Williams's mind, but but Kant, in a way, dis distills the um, the the thinking of morality most purely. I think Williams uh, supposes, and uh, that seems true enough to me. Uh, and so, if this this way of carrying about more carrying out moral moral philosophy is itself alienated then um have we made any progress <laughs> uh, we it looks as though we've you know um, uh, moved from one kind of alienation into another this is not the alienation of a of um of a of a third party who's looking at um ethical life from a, an anthropological or sociobiological point of view it's um it's the um it's the alienation of the detached philosopher i guess the armchair um that's not out in the street with the people um the seminar room the study um 
reflecting the flaws we're reflecting alone. Um, that that um, that um, um, can make it sound as though Kant is just doing something else. So we need to go back to the first section of the groundwork and consider what Kant takes himself to be doing. This is the place where he says he is giving an analysis of ordinary moral cognition. And he does give examples of duty, which are, um, I don't know what Williams would say, but they seem to me to be pretty much um, um, first order concepts, you know, to, to, to preserve one's life, to help others in need where one can, um, to, um, to um, be honest in one's promises and things like that. These seem to be pretty, pretty much thick concepts. Um, and so Kant does take that as a starting point. Um, then you get this rather um, um, striking analysis that takes us to a very high level very quickly. Um, ears pop, you know, <laughs> cognitive ears pop as you ascend to the, um, the first formulation there in the pages of the first section. Um, and the air is very thin. And you can wonder how on earth we could, um, is, is this really the, the mere form of a law überhaupt? Uh, is that really what, oh, what the, what's behind our concrete moral thinking when we are helping someone in need? Um, but you know, as far as the text goes, we know what Kant says. He says, this is the, we have arrived at the principle of duty, he says, and um, um, ordinary moral understanding has this principle always before its eyes. He says that just flat out, always before its eyes. Well, <laughs> um, he also thinks that he's the first philosopher, you know, to have formulated this. So it, it's kind of how do you put those two together? Well, he thinks that his formula is new. Um, that's something he a point he makes clear in the second critique. Um, but the principle he supposes is something we've known all along. So he, he makes this very important distinction between the formula that the philosopher comes up with, which is universal, very abstract, and the principle that it's meant to articulate, which we all have known all along. Um, and it can be a hard thing to put into words. Um, notice this, the, the millennia that have passed before the philosopher has come along and, and, and formulated it. But, but that's, um, that's just um, to, um, to an indication that it's very deep, deep seated uh, and, and something that can be overlooked if our analysis is not properly conducted. We can maybe be too close to the surface, as Williams is happy to remain, I guess. But Kant thinks that uh, if we want to get to a principle, and of course, Williams is skeptical as to whether there is any such principle, but if we want to, to find it, we're going to need to think fairly deeply. And so that's what Kant is trying to do. He, um, in keeping with this distinction between the principle and the formula, he says a few pages later, he repeats that, you know, this is the principle that ordinary reason always has before its eyes, ordinary human reason always has before its eyes. And then he adds very helpfully, to be sure, not in this abstract universal form, <laughs> but nevertheless, it does always have it before its eyes and uses it as a compass in all of its, and so, and then Socrates is invoked, um, who, by the way, um, I mentioned that Kant criticizes earlier ancient philosophers, um, but as far as I know, Socrates is the one philosopher that Kant never criticizes. Um, so he see, has some idea that philosophy, if it's careful, can tease out an abstractly expressible um, account of the understanding that we all share all along. Um, Williams is skeptical about whether this can be done He's been reading Kant. Um, he doesn't think Kant can pull it off, but he hasn't thought his way through to thinking of this as a kind of knowledge. And um, he's, he accepts that there is moral knowledge or ethical knowledge. Um, he thinks that morality endangers us, um, right? In this famous part of, of ethics and limits of philosophy, he suggests that reflection can destroy knowledge. Um, in fact, I think what Kant is 
pointing out is what the form of knowledge will be for the practical use. And so really Kant, I think is trying to, um, you might say, um, um, take William seriously and think through what this must be if it is indeed the knowledge that William says it is that we have of our concrete um, duties to one another, obligations. Um, and um, the analysis may be um, called for further attention that Williams has given it, but I think that Kant supposed that if Williams um, would suspend his skepticism for long enough to really think through what he already recognizes in recognizing that we do have concrete ethical knowledge, what that implies, um, he'll be, um, if he can, if he's got, you know, enough of a kind of philosopher in him, he can um, find his way to an appreciation of that, of that, of the principle as something that can be formulated in the way that Kant formulates it. So there's a, a kind of um, 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 very demanding um, analysis that Kant carries out. It's not written, it's not, it's not a work of popular philosophy, this groundwork, even though we teach it to undergraduates, uh, weirdly, um, it's not intended for that kind of audience. It's meant for philosophers who are themselves already seasoned in, 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 in reflection upon the topics of ethics. Um, these philosophers are supposed to um, be able to grasp this um, um, formulation. And I think that um, the jury's still out on whether this um, account um, will be attain a wider rec recognition within the Anglophone community than it has to date. I think that it's becoming more widely accepted than it was before, but um, I think that um, seeing the seeing the connection with with Aristotle and antiquity, um, recognizing more more in more detail way what Kant is doing, what he's not doing. Um, can all help um, appreciate that this, although it is very abstract and maybe carries some dangers of a kind of alienation, um, nevertheless um, um, is resolutely as, um, aspiring to remain in the shoes of ordinary moral consciousness. Um, if that ordinary human, human subject has the aptitude for philosophy, they can see this, any one of them, that's the idea. Um, and um, so the, um, um, the, the work of readers of Kant then is um, to try to help us all uh, negotiate that analysis more readily. And let me add one last thing. Um, the, 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 the formulas are so abstract and so universal that um, that is, in its own right is a cause for doubt on the part of many, many modern philosophers, especially those who are broadly wedded to a certain kind of naturalism. They think that it's kind of species independent, um, all rational beings. When Kant speaks of humanity in the second formula, for example, he's not talking about the human biological species. He's talking about rational nature, which could be shared by rational beings of, that could be uh, of other biological species than the human. And some people get worried about, some philosophers get worried about the idea that more there could be a kind of moral uh, community that would extend across different species. Um, I think that that um, on reflection is already something that we, we, we suppose in our ordinary thinking. We're always talking to animals, um, science fiction is full of, you know, encounters with aliens and they're viewed as rational. We're just naively projecting rationality onto the world beyond. So I think that the philosophers get skeptical in their in their armchairs, but it's already natural to human reason to think of itself as possible in other species. And so it's nothing at odds with human reason to suppose that the, that the human, the humanity is not confined to a particular biological species. But there are many difficult questions that will come up in that connection. And one last thing, um, because it's so abstract, 
there is then the big question of how then we get back down, <laughs> how it's connected to the ordinary things that we take ourselves to be obliged to do, and the differences that separate one society from another, one historical period from another. There are all kinds of difficulties that arise there, and Kant doesn't have a lot to say about that. He does have a metaphysics of morals in which he spells out a whole system of duties, which does get a lot more concrete than the groundwork. But even there, all that he avails himself of is the idea of human nature, now bringing in our biological species and um, positioning himself to talk about general duties that we have as human beings to human beings, not hum members of humanity generally, um, not just that, but also human, human animals. Um, that is the biological species, um, members of that species, the obligations they have to one another. Um, uh, and, and come down by kind of specification, introducing more content to be informed by the general form. And um, that's the way in which he thinks of philosophical ethics as proceeding from the common to the proper, as Aquinas put it, gradually introducing further conditions that are more specific to our setting. And as we descend in this ladder, we get more and more contingency, more and more local variety. Um, we, get, we get into territory where the obligations or the duties are confined to a particular group. So we'll have a, a maybe a general will that's formed by members of a particular community that, that live in a certain valley, say, between two mountain mountain ranges, and, and we're us and they're them outside, and their duties we have to one another, certain practices. Um, all of that can keep going as long as it's under a general form um, that ensures that we're treating one another as human persons. Um, and have not lost sight of the fact that we may not be the only persons in the cosmos. Um, but we have, we, but as we you know, descend from there to local communities, to families, um, the, the requirements become increasingly enriched, but this can all be practical knowledge all the way down. It just gets further and further determined as long as it's in accordance with the general principles. And as we go down, um, we need to engage in not just a solo reflection, you know, can I will my maxim of the universal law, but we have to start thinking, what can we agree upon um, as a kind of uh, a, a, an arrangement by which we can all live together as persons equal under law? And that's where the contractualist picture begins, comes into its own. The, the, the idea of, of, um, of um, constructivism has its proper home down in this territory where we are trying to work out how to live together. Um, but as long as we're doing that under the, you know, within the general framework, we can speak of ourselves as knowing how we should act with regard to one another. We can go all the way down. And so Williams can have his concrete, thick concepts. Um, it's just that a philosopher like Kant is not going to talk about these topics because it's not proper for a philosopher to go solo and tell us all what we ought to do in these particular situations. That needs to be worked out by the people whose interests are affected immediately. And it's a joint deliberative project to determine these questions, not some philosopher in his armchair. The abstract form, yeah, but not the concrete, rich, thick concepts. That's great. I appreciate that. Yeah, that was a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. And um, I suppose, uh, let's see.